welcome everybody uh, and welcome to the very first Race Academy uh, live webinar series coming live from head office in Castle Hill. So uh, episode one, natural selection of restorative materials for crown, bridge and implant material choice. But this might be a little scaring for you guys and bringing you back to your university days. Here's the periodic table of elements. So I'm going to talk through today basically what materials we use from this element uh, in today's manufacture of restorative. These are all the ones we're currently using in today. These ones represent our ceramic department. These ones for our alloys. Implants are predominantly here and our polycrystalline or more strong materials come down in this department here. So for crown and bridge and implant restorative, we've always looked back towards metal, metal being a pretty popular one for obvious reasons. The porcelain fused to metal has been the benchmark since the 1950s. Today's focus on nanocomposites is a substantial investment for a lot of dental um, uh, manufacturers today. Glass ceramics is a big favorite of mine for our aesthetic department. And of course, our zirconia restorations are probably our number one requested. And I do wear an I Love Zirconia badge because of what it's done for our industry. I do appreciate what it's done and where it's taken us. So back to full metal restorations. Obviously, gold has been a fantastic product. It's malleable, it bends, it flexes, and it doesn't break. So it's been a quite a popular restoration for many years. Unfortunately, uh, the restorative choice for patients, not so much due to aesthetics. Um, but also we've noticed the price of gold uh, has climbed. So the people who do like the metal alloys are starting to drift away from the gold products here over to what we call our non-precious department. And we're starting to see growth in our metal department onto our 3D printed materials. Here we have our selective laser melting technology or SLM. This is our EOS M270 machine that 3D prints directly into cobalt chrome alloy. We see 20 micron layers of cobalt chrome up across the top of each and then a cross-sectional view of the design is then laser melted to the layer below. And over time in 20 micron layers, we see these slowly built up until we get the restoration that we want. For full gold alloys and for PFM frameworks, this is basically how it comes out of the mill here. It's, we just break off these sprues by hand and then trim the alloy like this and prepare it for our porcelain fused to metal result. Now, PFMs and non-precious didn't get on too well. And we noticed that non-precious alloys were uh, delaminating the porcelain. And I think that spawns more from the inability to flow when casting. So this 3D printed material gives us a 99% dense material and better rigidity. So we no longer see the delamination issues spawn from casting discrepancies of yesterday. So our PFMs that are using our now cobalt chrome non-precious material, that's 3D printed, we're finding even better results than our precious alloy cast PFMs. We don't see a lot of PFMs these days, but uh, the ones we do for necessity, um, we, we do prefer to use the cobalt cram alloy uh, for rigidity, uh, strength and delamination results. Full metal alloys though, we, we can 3D print in chrome. They're just polished directly and we get these sorts of results. And I think it's a, um, uh, some, some nice result. The porcelain fused to metal has been the benchmark for a long time. Um, we can see these sorts of results that we got many, uh, for, for many, many years. Unfortunately, if we look just here, you'll see we get some delamination and fracture issues. And this here is the reason um, that uh, PFMs have been uh, replaced with stronger and better results. If we also look in these areas here, you'll also see the, the grain structure is quite coarse and felspathic porcelain that bonds to metal is quite a coarse porcelain so the wear to the opposing dentition is quite substantial. Another reason why the industry were looking for a monolithic solution. But again the porcelain fused to metal result was the benchmark for a long time. Now unfortunately for porcelain fused to metal restorations we see the light travel through the porcelain and hits the coping underneath. 
and unfortunately the shadow is cast down the gingiva and it casts the shadow up into the gingival area. Not good for people with high lip lines and not so aesthetic for the grey marginal line. For metal free restorations, the light passes through the enamel and through the coping as well. This lights up the core of the tooth like an optic fibre bundle and lights up the gingiva and we see much nicer results subgingivally, eliminating that black line around the margin and also for high lip lines we no longer see a grey restoration up high. This is why I'm not a big fan of the PFM. Uh, now we have uh, successful metal-free restorative materials. So out came glass ceramics, which I really fell in love with. We looked at materials like Inceram and Spinel and Illumina, and a lot of failures pushed us down a path to find success. So when glass ceramics came out, I was a big fan. And this is an Empress veneer, our first of the glass ceramic materials that this laboratory launched some time ago. And not only could we see fluorescent properties that were the same and reflective properties that were the same, we also enabled us to see the light reflection match the natural teeth. And we could start getting nice results in these regions um, uh, with this material. I fell in love with it. Uh, it's what I did my master's in in Germany, so I really learnt to love this material. So then we moved on to try and reflect the aesthetics of glass ceramics, and they brought out um, lithium disilicate or Emax, and we could now get some nice results with much stronger restorations. And these sort of results you can see in these regions here, we've got nice translucency. Uh, beautiful labial characterization and we can get some nice natural results with a much stronger product such as lithium disilicate. So the world started looking at lithium disilicate and here on this side we can see a layered zirconia restoration. This is a layered lava product from 3MSB, another great product back in the day. And if we look here at the light transmission through lithium disilicate, much brighter and lighter the zirconium oxide was a nice strong material, but we still needed to layer it with porcelain to get the aesthetics that we're looking for. This decreased the light transmission capability and also decreased the strength. The strongest material can be is the weakest link, which is the bond between the porcelain and the zirconia. If we look here at the lithium disilicate product on the left, we can see we have a strength of approximately 360 MPa. A layered zirconia restoration, as I mentioned, the strongest restoration we can get in any layered product is around 120 MPa, and that's in the hands of a good technician and a quality lab with good products. The coping underneath may be 900 MPa, but again, the strongest we can get from any layered restoration is the bond between the two. So unfortunately, we had a great product, but it was letting us down a little bit, so this monolithic solution was where we wanted to focus. So we could see now with Emax and lithium disilicate, we can actually start getting some nice results. Here's a case Race Dental Laboratory did some time ago when Emax first came out. The preparations are shown and they could be replaced with, uh, with lithium disilicate or Emax products. We've got some nice translucency, the labial characterization and all the aesthetics there for, for nice results. So now the industry is appreciating uh, metal free solutions uh, much nicer marginal integrity, no graying of the gingiva that PFMs used to give us. So um, we've really come a long way now. And that's when we launched Zirconia. Um, we still were looking for added strength and Zirconia came out. For those that you are unaware of what Zirconia is, Zirconium dioxide, known as Zirconia, is a white crystalline oxide of Zirconium. And this is where I really started to enjoy the material science component of what, of what we do when Zirconia came out. And today, more than 75% of the restorative manufacture at head office in Castle Hill is done in Zirconia. Why Zirconia? It's been used for a long time in many different realms. It's super smooth, so it's used in the cooking department. Uh, it's resistant to heat is, uh, is very powerful, so ball bearings uh, and that different things are manufactured. Uh, this sort of restoration, one my wife's less fan of, is uh, another use of zirconia. And so you can see the edge stability of zirconia is, uh, is fantastic. So if you were to head down to the King of Knives, 
and ask for the best edge stability or the sharpest blade that doesn't lose its edge or sharpness, they'll give you a zirconia restoration. So we can really taper those restorations down to a knife edge now and know that we can maintain that strength long term. So that was when it was introduced to the dental industry, admittedly initially for layered restorations. So why zirconia? Zirconia is very high in strength, of which we spoke about. It goes from around 700 to 1200, depending on the translucency requirements of the material. It's crack resistant and undergoes a phenomenon called transformation toughening, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. The, the, uh, the zirconia strength allows for traditional PFM crown and bridge preparation design, and that's powerful because we don't need to change our preparation or cementation techniques as clinicians. The higher strength of zirconia. Crowns and bridges allows traditional cementation as well as bonding. The coping thickness or restoration thickness can be as little as three tenths. And that's pretty powerful now because our technicians who are asking for more room and our clinicians who want to be minimally invasive are now both looked after by a minimal thickness restoration such as zirconia at a three tenths of a mil. The less need for tooth reduction and increase room for aesthetic porcelain. So our emergence profile can be improved. Our soft tissue adhesion around the subgingival margin area can be good, uh, which in, uh, decreases the chance of bone resorption through encroachment of the biological width. So the translucency of zirconia is very similar to natural dentine. I'll show you a slide of that in a moment. It's well regarded in the medical industry for its durability and long-term strength. And it's been used for well over 40 years now in the medical industry, predominantly for ball and hip joints uh, and internal use. Uh, due to the strength, the bridge connector sizes are quite similar to what we've done with PFMs with a seven millimeter anterior connector size and a nine millimeter posterior connector size and increases up to a 12 millimeter connector between two pontics, which was fantastic because I could launch the product without retraining our technicians. There's no doubt in the hands of industrial milling capabilities, the zirconia fits better. If we do have the, um, uh, the industrial milling technology, there's no doubt that the CAD CAM fits better than any traditionally manufactured result. And they're just more aesthetically pleasing than a PFM. There's no doubt about that. Are uh, zirconias all the same? On the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see a partially stabilised yttrix zirconia. And on the right hand side, you'll see one that has been infused with aluminium oxide. The aluminium oxide infused on the right hand side is much easier to produce. It's more cost effective produce, to produce, but it decreases the strength and also the translucency of the product. These large particles on the right hand side, which I'm highlighting now, are actually alumina, alumina particles, increasing the cost of restoration to be manufactured. Over here, you'll see a much more, on the left-hand side, a more homogenous finish. This is what a well-made zirconia looks like. And I think it's super important that you get a branded or well-made zirconia. Otherwise, you just will not get the translucency nor the strength that we require. Another good example here. On the right-hand side, you'll see poorly manufactured. You'll see the air pockets around. Uh, if they don't use the lumina, the air pockets around a non-densely sintered ball or uh, a less compressed zirconia compared to the homogenous finish on the left-hand side of a, of a premium zirconia. This one particularly is a 3MSB lava product. I think it was a fantastic product. I still do. And uh, it's super important to buy uh, or purchase and use a, a quality product. Again, the flexural strength, you can see on the left-hand side, the first slide here is a lava product and the strength of around sub 1200 as opposed to polycrystalline Procera product that you can see, I just don't believe to be manufactured as well. So again, look into the flexural strength and the manufacturing capabilities uh, because they do, they do make a difference. The processing manufacture, the processing steps in manufacturing zirconia also plays a role. The quality of the raw material enhances the strength, the longevity and the translucency. The isostatic press of the blank marginal fit translucency and strength and so on and so on. The steps that all of the manufacturing processes take, you can see even the sintering uh, does make a role in a translucency strength and longevity of the material. But super important to source the best of the best. Uh, and we look, we are constantly researching how to find better products. 
Today we use what I believe to be the best zirconia on the planet with Dental Direct. Uh, I really do believe it's probably the best one we could find. So rest assured, the products we use are um, as good as we can find. Here's a slide of what zirconia looks like when it comes out of the sintering furnace. Quite smooth. Um, no adjustments have been made, and it's a nice product. If you make an adjustment and grind the surface, i.e. an adjustment occlusal high spot, it's super imperative that it's adjusted and polished again. You can see that this photo here shows quite a coarse finish. The zirconia becomes a very coarse and unstable product, which is very detrimental to the opposing dentition. If it's polished again, it becomes the best product that you can use. And this actually a high polished and lusted zirconia is a smoother surface than a type 4 gold. At a room temperature, you can see in the, on the left-hand side now, the atomic structure of zirconia sits at what we call a tetragonal state. And on the right-hand side, if we have a block of zirconia and a crack that propagates from a loose diamond burr or a milling scar and propagates through the restoration, the, the dark orange component here is actually a change in atomic structure from a tetragonal state to a monoclinic phase, and it expands three to five percent. And whilst it does that, it compresses back on the crack because it can't compress outwards and arrests the crack from propagating. It's the only material on the planet that doesn't live that can heal itself, and this is why it's chosen to be used medically because um, it, if something does go wrong, they don't have to go in and operate with the patient. We can actually hope that the, the crack will be arrested from propagation and this is why it's been used medically for so long. What I do love about translucency of it, on the left hand side you'll see the relative transmission, sorry, the relative transmission of, um, of, of light transmission. Uh, and on the green line here shows the natural dentine and how it changes over time as the material gets thicker. And you'll see above that we have different materials. Although they're quite, they're all pretty good, the alumina, the lava, and the Empress II, glass ceramic, all show pretty good translucency. The one closest to natural dentine is the lava zirconia, which are, or, or the, the zirconia, which I really love. It's very similar to natural dentine. I uh, just want to hold up there. I've got some cases coming in. If uh, we have some questions coming in now, could um, one moment while I check. If you do have questions, there's an option to to um, to share those here, so feel free to go on there and, and type your questions in, and I'll do my best to uh, to answer those as we go. Uh, just one second. So yeah, okay. I've just been asked here uh, if there's any questions. Let us know. So. Also, the masking capability of zirconia. So it's super translucent, and I love what it can do, but it's also got a, an excellent capability to mask. And here's a high-tech scientific experiment that I did with a black text to mark across a white page, and I manufactured three bits of zirconia at 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0.9, and you can clearly see the masking capabilities at 0.9 of a millimetre, uh, which is very beneficial in, in restorative manufacture where needed. Here we can see an endodontically treated tooth and a metal post and core. Traditionally, the only way we could tackle that would be with PFM. But if you give us the right information and a crack stump shade, we can mask those discolorations with metal-free restorations. Please ensure you tell the laboratory when you do have discolorations and we can tackle that technically. These sorts of problems here with Empress, we used to have to change our ingot selection to mask that, but with zirconia, we no longer have to do that. So less pressure on the clinician uh, to be using um, zirconia than any of the original glass ceramics. You can see here a porcelain bonded to metal crown. The light showing through here, not good. And also the darkening of the gingiva around this area here. If that restoration is removed, and a layered zirconia restoration put in, you can see how similar the light transmission is to the natural tooth. Also a lightening of the gingiva here, so patients with a high lip line, uh, you get a much nicer result. And no longer do you have that black blackening of the margin. So if you have a patient that uh, walks around with a torch in his mouth, uh, this is probably the restoration for you. Sorry about that. Anyway, moving on. Water, water corrosion. 
Um, this was something I spent time with John Sorensen, and he explained that uh, when materials take on water or go through imbibition or saliva intake, they can change in strength. And I looked at the top here of our Empress and Empress 2 materials, Empress 2 being lithium disilicate or the same as the Emacs. You can see a decrease in strength on the right-hand side of 20%. So when we were manufacturing, we were sending crowns out and, and, and totally unaware that they were decreasing in strength when they went through inhibition. Down the bottom here, you'll see a study that John sent me about zirconia and actually see when it takes on saliva or water, it actually increases in strength 5%. I don't believe 5% is enough to write home about and, be, and to advertise that it gets stronger, but you can see it doesn't decrease in strength and it's no longer detrimental long-term, unlike some of these other products. It was quite shocking to see that we were sending restorations out that weren't as strong as we believed they would be. Here's me and my technical team after we realised that, um, uh, that things were decreasing. I ran straight back to the lab. I increased our connector thicknesses and to ensure that our, our anterior bridges for lithium disilicate were as strong as we thought they'd be. So, um, yeah, be sure that you're, you're, you're rectifying connector thicknesses predominantly when you're using materials that decrease in strength once going through imbibition. Okay, just checking questions now. I don't seem to have an option here to see them. Uh, oh, here we go, one second. Okay, we're just sorry about the uh, blocking your screen then. Uh, so we're talking about how, how easy is it to perform an access cavity through a zirconia crown? Also, does the crown require replacement after the RCT is completed? Uh, great question. Uh, it's super difficult to cut through zirconia. I'm just going to keep this up here for a moment. Um, I did have a clinician once tell me um, it's pretty easy to remove, to cut through zirconia. you just got to cancel the next three patients and buy a new Burkitt. Um, and that's probably as honest as I could be. Uh, it is difficult to get through. Uh, I do have a removal technique that I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, but yes, the crown should be replaced should you go through it. Although people do tell me they can cut through it and plug. Uh, but clinically, I think it's best to replace any restoration that's been cut through. I appreciate that question. And I have another one here. Uh, we're asking, why would zirconia fail more so over implants and especially around um, full arches? Uh, I don't personally see a lot of failure over implants. Um, to be honest, our full arch cases don't really see a lot of failure, so I'm unsure um, how to answer that one. Um, so, yeah, in our lab, we probably don't see that. I could suggest probably using a more a better quality zirconia uh, and possibly look up Dental Direct if, that, if you're having those failures. It's probably from a, uh, a more cost-effective solution. So uh, using our restorations, uh, you're probably, uh, probably more safe. If there's any more questions, and I'm just checking them out now, let us know. I think they're trickling through, but I'll move on due to uh, time restraints. So again, you can see, sorry, we can see the uh, there's two layered lava restorations. So we've got this fantastic product. We've got excellent edge stability. We've got fantastic translucency. We've got unbelievable masking capability uh, with extreme strength, uh, but we're still having to layer the product to get the get the solution looking nice. And you can see here layered restorations on zirconia with taking advantages of, of zirconia but having to layer. So the world here, you can see our zirconia restorations on, on, uh, on implants. We don't have those issues. That's coming from another lab. I hope you can find solutions to, to, to that. But the industry now wanted to take advantage of those monolithic, monolithic benefits that we spoke about before. So they came out and started focusing on monolithic translucent zirconia. And I think over time, uh, they started to get some nice looking results and they grew in popularity pretty quickly. So we started seeing these sort of restorations grow and grow quickly. Um, the translucency was good. Uh, they were number one material choice for posterior restorations. And the opalite restoration became Australia's number one selected restoration within a couple of years. Unfortunately, anteriorly, we had some issues with um, the aesthetics of it. So we started to focus on super translucent uh, zirconia to try and tackle that. And Dental Direct launched their super translucent zirconia called Cubex. And on the left here, you'll see a BD Cubex restoration. And on the right-hand side, the most translucent 
lithium disilicate or Emax rest of motion that could be made. And you can see there's not a lot of difference to them. So anteriorly now, we have this beautiful translucent zirconia restoration that's much stronger than lithium disilicate. And we started seeing them replacing the not as strong Emax restorations up front. So for full crowns, this was probably becoming the material of choice. So removal techniques, and I hope this tells the, the last person who asked that question, one of our clinicians was telling us if you do see this, to choose a burr that is uh, the finest diamond you can, not the roughest diamond you can, under irrigation, and very lightly, very lightly touching the zirconia. If you push hard with the burr, the zirconia is stronger than the bond between the diamond particles and the burr itself. So when you push hard, the diamond comes off the burr and you'll leave black lines. If you use a very fine diamond and touch very lightly, the, it'll eat into the zirconia, and these cuts shouldn't take more than five to 10 minutes, and then just twist them off with your burr. These restorations uh, should be able to come off, but I think fine diamond with light adjustments, light touch will get a better result than a, than a, than a heavy-handed result. The nanocomposites, and we see a lot of these trending now um, with Vita and 3M and, uh, and products like that are investing a lot of money in trying to find a solution that will act as the periodontal ligament would for implant cases. And these materials now are soft and they're hoping that they will act like the periodontal ligament would. Down here, you'll see the ligament. And the, unfortunately, we have an implant with a hard abutment and a hard product and there's no give. So these hybrids are set and designed to try and act like the shock absorber. Um, and they're, they're slowly slowly gaining traction. Um, we're seeing a little bit of demand, probably not as much as I would like. We do see them to be very easy, easy to make. The larva ultimate on the left here, you can see the edge stability because they're soft, they can be milled as opposed to phosphatic glass or lithium disilicate that are a little bit difficult, more difficult to mill. Um, but what I do like about it is down the bottom left here, you'll see the, um, the wear to the opposing dentition is pretty near zero in comparison to predominantly feldspathic materials and um, unpolished or even polished and glazed lithium disilicate. Zirconia doesn't show these aggressive results. It's closer to this, but only if it's polished correctly, as I mentioned before. This is the Vita Enamic product that we manufacture here. Um, we do a bit of it. Uh, if the person that wants to know if they wanted to reduce or get through an endodontically treated tooth or uh, maybe a material choice like this would be better if you envisage there might be a need to have to drill through. Okay, I'm just going to pop down here. I think I have another question. Apologies about the grey spot. Um, okay. What's the most effective way to polish the cornea after adjustment? And I've also been asked if we can finish this and ask the questions a bit later, but I'll answer this one first. Uh, the best way to polish the cornea is using a traditional crown and bridge or layered porcelain polishing kit. Race do actually provide a polishing kit for our clinicians. Uh, it's a very cost-effective 12 burr kit. Uh, if you wanted just to let us know, one, let one of our customer support team know that you're interested. But any porcelain polishing kit will do the job uh, for polishing zirconia as well. Zirconia, lithium disilicate, and feldspathic porcelain are all polished with the same burrs. So thank you for that question. Okay, so you can see here, just to finish up soon, uh, the difference on the left-hand side, we've got the strength of veneering ceramic, feldspathic porcelain, PFMs, layered to zirconia, whatever it may be, is only as strong as the weakest link, which is the layer between the two. Hybrid ceramics, a little bit stronger again, which is our Vita Enamic. Uh, you can see around 150 to 160 MPA. Lithium disilicate, Emax is one of the brands. There's a number of those now, uh, Amber Mill, etc. They're coming out and tackling the Emax team uh, at around 360 to 400. Often zirconia goes through a number of different stages. You can see alumina here, which we don't use anymore. PDX zirconia, which is translucent zirconia, and we move our way up to uh, the super translucent zirconia. Really translucent, but still quite strong. So I think they're um, from translucent, super translucent zirconia up to our, what we call opaque zirconia at the top here, which is used for masking discoloration and layering restoration. So the monolithic growth has been huge. I spoke to Race Dental's data analysis and reporting team and asked them to provide us with 
uh, the numbers from 2010 to uh, 2018, and you can see the growth of the monolithic restorations over time from left-hand side all the way up to 2018. Huge growth in comparison to the decline of the PFM. So there's no doubt that the world loves these monolithic solutions. And we can understand why. I think uh, it makes a lot of sense to, uh, to have a stronger, more aesthetic restoration. I wanted to know if what was happening in this lab was happening around the world. So some time ago, I approached a lab in the States uh, who sent me this information. This is Glide World Dental Laboratories results. And you can see their growth of monolithic clearly as opposed to their, the, the decline of their PFM. So this is obviously happening, happening globally. And uh, I'm confident that the way we're tracking it is the way the world's uh, best are tracking as well. But really, almost too easy. You get the right materials, you choose the right materials, you do what you do as clinicians well and use a quality lab and we can uh, hopefully get these results and ultimately give the patient uh, what it is they need long term for stability. So I appreciate everybody's time today. I would like to, just before we go, is talk about same time, same bat channel, same time next week. We have a live lab tour through Race Dental, which will demonstrate in detail a live cycle of a restorative case through Race Dental, detailing the quality control procedures, the uh, articulation trimming and digitised steps, our milling and printing capabilities, and uh, the, the administrative and digital workflow through the lab. Just some questions, Matt, regarding what type of zirconia we offer at Race, just the, our zirconia options. That was just oh. up through a chat that wasn't in the normal Q and A. Would you be able to sort of touch on that for us? Certainly, we offer three. Well, actually, three types of zirconia plus the lava restoration. So we do provide lava restoration, which is a layered zirconia, and we have a lava plus restoration, which is a branded three MSB product. But our most re our most requested material is uh, opalite, which we call our translucent zirconia. It's for it's uh, super strong and for long span bridges for minimally invasive dentists who uh, don't like to cut a lot of tooth structure away and then we anteriorly we use our crystal light restoration which is the super translucent zirconia which uh, we do reserve for anterior restorations and maximum three inner bridges with the most distal abutment being the five so uh, and then we have our, tr our opaque zirconia which is predominantly only reserved for masking discoloration and layered restorations. So they're the three most popular products. Opalite is the most requested crown now, uh, Australia-wide, and Crystallite is fast on its heels because it's a really translucent product. Personally, if I was to have a crown in my mouth, I would probably choose the Crystallite restoration. It's strong and beautiful. So I hope that answers the question. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. Pleasure. Anything else there, Whitney? I do appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact customer support. Alternatively, I'm here at any time. My email address is matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at racedental.com.au. Thank you for your time, everyone.